My name is Brian Sage. I'm the rector at St. Columns Episcopal Church in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Uh, my title has the very in front of it, the very reverend, because I'm also the dean of the Central Convocation. I'm married to Kyle Dice Sage. Kyle's also a priest, and she serves at the at St. Philip's Episcopal Church in Jackson. We have two daughters, uh, Katie, who's 14, and Betsy, who's 11. They both attend St. Andrew's Episcopal School at the Upper Campus in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Uh, something interesting about myself and really about my family is that uh, uh, I was born and raised in Southern California and lived there until I was 31 years old when I went off to seminary. So. The obvious next question that most people ask me is, how did you get to Mississippi? Well, it's simple. I married a Southern woman. I met Kyle when I was in seminary. She was a year ahead of me. Uh, this was in 1994, and we were married about a year after that. And at the end of my seminary experience, when I was uh, in the process of graduating and uh, planning for ordination, the Bishop of Mississippi, uh, Bishop Marble, made it real clear to Kyle that uh, it was expected that she come back to Mississippi and serve as the Associate Rector at St. John's in Pascagoula. And then he said, oh, by the way, bring your husband with you. And uh, the Bishop of Los Angeles couldn't make us any promises as far as employment and, and, and ministry possibilities. So he, so he said, go to Mississippi with your wife, do a curacy, and then come back after two or three years. That was 17 years ago, and I'm still here, still happy to be here, and uh, why have I stayed? I've stayed because the body of Christ here in Mississippi has taken such good care of me and has uh, represented Christ's love in so many amazing ways. I'd like to reframe that question just a little bit. Um, I'd like to reframe it by saying, why do I feel called to be in the discernment process for Bishop of Mississippi? And I'd like to reframe that because I think that discernment is, is different than a call, and it's the beginning of a call because discernment is really twofold. It's my assessing and pray, prayerfully asking God for guidance, but it's also the community coming together and, and, and prayerfully asking God who it is they're inviting to be their next bishop, be their next priest, or whatever the case may be. But I feel called to be in this discernment process for a lot of reasons, primarily because right after Bishop Gray announced his retirement a year ago, I started getting phone calls from friends of mine and colleagues and others who um, kept asking me, Brian, will you consider a nomination for bishop? My, my response, and this is honest, my honest response to them was uh, not just no, but heck no. Actually, it was a little more pointed than that, but I won't go into that right now. Um, but those questions and those inquiries from colleagues and friends and people who cared really kept coming, and they didn't stop. And uh, at the same time, I began to feel a sense that, uh, that I needed to think about my my vocation a little bit, think about my relationship at St. Columns, not necessarily because it was stale or boring, but simply it was time. I'd been there for almost nine years, and it was time to perhaps reassess some expectations that we had of each other. And then just about a year ago, almost to the day, um, I, I got a phone call from a friend of mine. And uh, this is someone I'd practiced ministry with on the coast for a lot of years, and someone who'd been very much of a mentor and a friend. And uh, and, and he just and, and he was, he's somebody who's diametrically opposite to me theologically. We are in completely different camps. And he called and said, "Brian, your name came up at lunch, and I'd like to. Uh, I, I want to just ask you to just just consider it when you're nominated. Just think about it. Just pray about it, and, and just just consider it." And I said, "You know where I stand on issues, and I know where you stand. And why would you want me to be your bishop?" And he said because you're approachable. You're approachable and you listen. You're approachable and I can talk to you. And that was for me the moment when I realized fully and clearly that I, I needed to take this seriously. That God had, uh, had sent me, uh, as I've said before, a, a, a truck, a boat, and a helicopter. And now as God finally opened it, saying, what else do you want? Take this seriously. Pray about it. Consider it. 
and enter into discernment on this. And so that's what we did. And Kyle and I prayerfully considered at that point and, and have been doing so ever since. And literally one day at a time, we've, we've dealt with this and one step at a time and one moment of a at a time. And it's been a great process. I've learned a lot about my call. I've enjoyed talking with folks about my call as well and about our mutual call. And this is the point now where I really firmly believe that the community, the body of Christ, comes together and, and asks God to direct who it is they believe is called to be the next bishop of Mississippi. It's not just me assessing a call, but it's all of us mutually doing that within community. That's, to me, how the body of Christ works. Evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. That's, that's really important to me. And I know Episcopalians don't like to hear that. In fact, I should have warned you that I was going to say that and told you to grab your chair. Um, I believe that us talking about Christ and sharing our experience with Christ and sharing our love for the Lord is so, so important. And it's something that we shouldn't be scared to do, but many of us are. Um, I think we should be willing and able to go out and tell others about Christ. I think we should be willing and able to invite someone to come to church with us. I think we should be willing and able to tell others that we are part of a unique tradition, a wonderful tradition, with sacred traditions that date back to the first century. I think we need to be willing and able to tell folks that we are part of a tradition that celebrates Christ's love, drinks from a common cup, and goes from that place carrying his love and represents it to the world. I think evangelism is really, really important. I also, a lot of priests don't like talking about it, a lot of clergy don't like talking about it, but I think stewardship is huge. And I think stewardship is something that often scares folks, but we shouldn't be scared about it. And it's not just about money, it's about our relationship with our Lord. It's about giving back to God that which has been given to us. I get excited about stewardship and I like talking about stewardship because I think it helps us loosen the grip that sometimes money and possessions have on us. And loosen that grip that keeps us from following Christ as closely as we possibly can. And, and think about our parishes for a minute. Think about some of the needs we have in this diocese as a whole. Stewardship can help make sure that we fund ministry for the future, not just in our local parishes, but in the diocese and within other parishes as a, as a whole. With under the umbrella stewardship, I also, I've been a privilege to be a part of a, several capital campaigns. And I think a diocesan capital campaign would be a great way for us to energize ourselves together, us for do, to do some things to fund ministry for the future. Imagine how cool it would be if we could go out and create some endowments, perhaps an endowment to help fund some of those smaller churches that are having trouble struggling, perhaps an endowment to help churches make it over the hump from being a pastoral-sized church through the transition process and into the program-sized process. Imagine how great it would be if we could endow youth ministry so that we could train youth leaders to go into places and to raise up ministry in those places and to offer ministry to young people. Imagine how great it would be if we could endow some of the continuing ministries at Gray Center and Camp Bratton Green. That's a treasure that we don't want to lose, but we need to assess what we have and gift back to God so that these ministries can continue. Also, planned giving. This is not an original statement, but I'm going to steal it from whoever it is that, that originally said it. The largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world is taking place right now. If the church doesn't go out and ask people to include the church, the local church, the diocese, Camp Bratton Green, whatever the case may be, in their wills, people aren't going to do that. At St. Columns, we were the beneficiaries of a wonderful gift from two loyal parishioners. All they did was go to a planned giving seminar. They learned about how important it was to do this. They went home on Monday, they called their lawyer, they wrote the church into their will for 10%. We now have a wonderful playground in the back of our church where young families play. There's actually a play group that meets there every Wednesday morning. 
We actually have a new stained glass window in our church in loving memory of Sig and June Steinberger, these wonderful beneficiaries. And we have some money in the bank to fund future ministry as well. I think these things are huge. And and along with that, I'd be remiss if I didn't also say that I believe something is really important. One church in mission, inviting, transforming, and reconciling. Sounds familiar? That was part of Bishop Gray's tent initiative. I'd love to see us revision that. I'd love to see us rework with that. I'd love to see us perhaps dust it off to comp- or dry it off since it got washed away with Katrina and perhaps try to work within that. What more, what's more important as Christians for us to do than invite, transform, and reconcile and be one church as we do that in mission?